All right. Today we have a special guest lecture, Professor Joan Murillo from the De uh, Department of Biology created a video presentation for us. So I'll start by saying a few words of introduction to the topic, and then we'll watch Professor Murillo's video, and then I'll give some final remarks. Today's topic is the Sonoran Desert Toad, also known as the Colorado River Toad, Bufo alvarius, and perhaps more, more recently, Encilius alvarius. Let's start by talking about nomenclature. The common names Sonoran Desert Toad and Colorado River Toad both refer to the sole habitat of the species. The scientific names are less obvious and require a dictionary. Bufo is from Latin and means toad. I couldn't find a clear etymology of Encilius. It's obviously of Latin origin, and it looks like it might be a synonym for bufo, in other words, meaning toad. Alvarius is also from Latin and means of or relating to the stomach. So the scientific name might well mean the stomach frog or something like that. At any rate, the species was first described using the name Encilius, but it looks like that didn't catch on in popular culture, and people started using the term bufo instead. At some point around the early 2000s, people started to use the name Encilius again. Notwithstanding, it appears that the name bufo alvarius might be a little bit more common in the psychedelic community, and in the herpetological community, it might, it might be more common to call it Encilius alvarius. Um, because I learned bufo alvarius first, I'm going to use that. Because taxonomical nomenclature is an ever-present tool in the study of nature, it might be worth saying a few words on it. From what I've seen, uh, as an outside observer from the humanities perspective, scientific taxonomy is something that is constantly evolving as we learn more about the world around us. For example, we've seen scientific name changes with morning glories, which started out as Turbina corimbosa, and then it was known as Rivea corimbosa, and now it's most commonly called Ipomoea corimbosa. Also, numerous psilocybin mushrooms have undergone scientific name change. Psilocybe cubensis, for example, started out as Straphoria cubensis. So sometimes this is just normal taxonomical adjustments. All right, because this is a course in ethnobotany, it's a little bit weird that we should be studying a toad. But many people would agree that, the, that this toad has powerful lessons to teach. When working with these powerful medicines, maybe the first lesson to learn is humility before the wonder and power of what we can find in a simple desert toad. Terence McKenna once commented on the personal humility necessary to accept that a lowly psychedelic fungus has something mind-blowing to teach you if you eat it. In that regard, it certainly is unexpected that the world's most powerful psychoactive substance is created by an animal that literally lives in the mud. It's one thing to be smitten with the romance of the blue lotus flower and its intoxicating essence. It's quite another to smoke dry toad venom. There really aren't many psychoactive compounds derived from animals. Instead, what you get are mainly toxins, poisons, venom, etc. Most of the time, these are noxious or deadly to humans. In some cases, they're helpful, medicinal, or recreational in the right amounts. An example of this is the pufferfish consumption in Japan where chefs need a strict certification to be allowed to prepare the fish. It's interesting to note that the pufferfish is also the main ingredient in the zombifying voodoo potion of Haiti, which very well might need a class of its own in the future. But for now, Bufo alvarius is the only animal that we're going to study in this course on ethnobotany. But Bufo is also unique because it's the most recent of all the sacred plant traditions that we're studying. Why does this matter? Because we can see the moment of discovery and track the beginning stages of its religious or spiritual development. 
Now, this is pretty incredible in a field where most discoveries are buried in the prehistoric past. We can't know exactly how long humans have been using plants to achieve altered states of consciousness, but we have a pretty good idea for some of them. Deep down, my gut tells me that uh, the use of these psychoactive plants somehow coincides with the development of metaphoric thought, which would include things like religion, culture, language, and art. Uh, but science, unfortunately, tells a story that doesn't go that far back. For instance, plants like Datura, Amanita, Henbane, Mandrake, Salvia, and Morning Glories all have documented uses in the many hundreds of years. Archaeological evidence suggests that ayahuasca use goes back at least a thousand years. The 400 magic mushroom stones of the middle pre-classic Maya period mainly from Southern Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador, have been dated to about 2,500 years old. The Greek kukion was used for 2,000 years, ending 1,500 years ago. In South America, San Pedro uh, use has also been confidently dated to about 4,000 years ago. Scientists have radiocarbon dated peyote specimens from the Shumla Cave in Texas to 6,000 years ago. For cannabis, there's written history dating back 5,000 years and archaeological evidence that most likely pushes that back to 10,000 years ago. Tobacco, according to recent studies, was first used over 12,300 years ago. So BUFO is certainly an anomaly in this regard. Its psychoactive effects were first experienced a mere 40 years ago. All right, the active molecule in Bufo, in Bufo alvarius uh, venom is 5-MeO-DMT. And I think Professor Murillo is going to be talking a little bit about that, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but give me, let me give you, a, give you a little bit of historical context. It was first synthesized in 1936, but it wasn't known to be psychoactive for another two decades. In 1959, it was identified as one of the active alkaloids in indigenous South American snuffs. That's to say, substances that are snorted into the nasal cavity, snorted or insulfated as blown into the nasal cavity. And we're going to be talking about South American snuffs uh, next semester, so I won't spend any time on that. Let's move on to 1960, 1968, when 5-MeO-DMT was discovered in the secretions of Bufo alvarius. But it wasn't until 1983 that a single brave psychonaut and investigator self-assayed the substance and first discovered the power of the toad. And boy, was it powerful. Five times more powerful than regular DMT, in fact. And when smoked, its molecular structure helps it cross the blood-brain barrier much faster than when the substance is insulfated, uh, insulfated into the nasal cavity like the seeds of the yopo tree. We see a similar increased potency when sniffing cocaine, uh, between sniffing cocaine and smoking crack rock. Smoking crack rock, obviously, is a height heightened experience. Because the substance is so overwhelmingly powerful, it gives a very clear look at the absolute height of the psychedelic experience and reminds us that these are powerful tools to be used with wisdom and treated with respect. So our invited lecture, invited lecture is by Professor Joan, uh, Joan Murillo of the biology department. And let's listen to what she has to say. Hello, my name is Professor Joan Murillo. Thank you for having me today as one of your guest lectures. Uh, I apologize that I couldn't be there in person. I have office hours all day today and students usually come in nonstop. Um, so I'm a professor at San Bernardino Valley College. I've been here for about 11 years or 12 years actually now. And I teach uh, human physiology primarily and students take me as a prerequisite or take my course prerequisite for nurse. See if we can get this back. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Professor Joan Murillo. Thank you for having me today as one of your guest lecturers. Uh, I apologize that I couldn't be there for about 11 years. Physiology primarily, and students take me as a prerequisite or take my course prerequisite for nursing. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about um, this really cool toad, and I'm excited to talk to you about it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. Um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> and I hope that at the end you will uh, email me with some questions or some follow-up questions. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of the background of the toad, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the toxin that they produce and then the uses in, in research. Um, the toad's name, so the common name is the Sonoran Desert Toad, and it is in Cilius alvaris. Um, it used to be known as Bufo, so most toads, um, the genus name is a first part, so that's Bufo, and then the family name, um, or excuse me, the species name is Alvarius, so it used to be Bufo Alvarius, it's now been changed in Cilius Alvarius. Um, the common name is a Sonoran Desert Toad, and so here's a picture of them, they're super cute. Um, the toads, so the background color that you see on the toads can range anywhere from a dark green, like in this picture, to a greenish brown, to a cream color, a tan, or almost a whitish color. And notice how they have little dots. We call these warts. They're not really warts, but they're spots and bumps on the back. Um, these bumps can be darkish colored to the lightish color that you see. Um, these toads get to be about four to five, they're about four to five inches in length. Um, they can be really big though. Um, toads are dry land animals, so frogs live in water, whereas toads live um, on land. Um, and I will, um, I want to play a little call for you, um, but I'll let the video get into more detail because they explain it better than I do. Um, but this is actually what they sound like. And they come out in... Um, uh, in the rainy season in Arizona. So let me show you the um, region for them. So normally, so the red indicates a region where you find the Sonoran Desert Toad. Um, they used to be in California, but they are no longer found in California or they're considered extinct in California because of farming practices and because of pesticides. Um, pesticides stay in the soil and these uh, toads normally, um, they hunker down and, and live in the soil um, until the rainy season when they come out and mate and um, eat and lay eggs. And so because the soil is where we collect most of the pesticides that farming uses stays in the soil and it's active for a long time, this affects their egg and, and sperm production. And so they don't, um, uh, they're not able to reproduce. And so they haven't been identified for quite a few years or found a quite a few years in California. And so that's something to be mindful of. Um, they're in Southeast south southern excuse me arizona and in uh sonoran region or the sonoran desert region of mexico obviously um and then there's a little video that i want to show you and then i'm going to talk a little bit about the toxins um the video so this video you can watch it on your own i have a link at the end of um of um the powerpoint for you oh sorry let me quit my email real quick. Sorry, you guys. Okay. My name is Robert Villa. I'm 36 years old, native Tucsonan. I am president of Tucson Herpetological Society. So I'm going to skip this part but in the, in the crib with me. So I think my destiny as a naturalist and a herpetologist was sort of sealed. I want to give a little shout out. Um, I know that a lot of students on campus think of biology classes as for nursing and medicine, but I also want to tell you that um, you can be a wildlife biologist and, and work for the Department of Fish and Game. Um, my background was actually, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I um, came out here to Cal State Fullerton for grad school and I studied sharks. So I studied physiology and biochemistry of sharks. And now I am a full-time professor um, teaching anatomy and physiology for the biology department. So there's a lot of other venues um, that you can do for science besides just um, 
taking care of people. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, this is a Sonoran Desert toad uh, in Cilius alvarius, and uh, we are just near a parking lot along the Santa Cruz River. The Sonoran Desert toad is uh, the amphibian version of the saguaro in that it's found nowhere else except in the Sonoran Desert region. Sorry, little guy. It was probably traumatic for you. They're big toads and they can live up to 20 years, probably more. They spend their lives mostly asleep uh, until monsoon season. They are actually awakened by the sound of running water or water hitting the ground, thunder. <laughs> That's what actually <laughs> brings them to the surface. And it's a race to eat, mate, lay eggs, eat some more, and go back under when the, uh, before the water dries up. Oh, here we go. And uh, people confuse these with bullfrogs because bullfrogs are also big and green. But again, toads have these big glands behind each eye and bullfrogs don't. The toad has produced this chemical 5-MeO-DMT as a defensive mechanism. And it takes a lot of harassment and a lot of stress for the toad to willingly um, exude the substance. 5-MeO-DMT purely uh, smoked and inhaled is an instant uh, trip out of consensus reality. It a, it's, can be likened to a near-death experience. I haven't smoked it. I don't intend to. People describe pixelated vision, extreme senses of euphoria, well-being, love, uh, clarity, a general awakening of re reality and consciousness. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people who react uh, negatively experience extreme trauma and years of, of therapy. Then about 2017, uh, I was approached by Vice Media to um, consult on an episode for a program that dealt in psychedelic substances. We were able to interview Yaki community elders and talk about the actual role the toad has in Yaki culture. To this date, there's no conclusive evidence that suggests that toads were used as psychedelics by any pre pre-Hispanic cultures. When the episode aired, uh, this really shot the toad into popularity. Even though there was factual information and we stated that it wasn't indigenous cultural practice, people wanted to experience it. To have this and use to use it is a federal offense. It's, it's breaking federal law. That doesn't stop people from doing it, of course. In 1980, a guy named Ken Nelson landed on an obscure paper which outlines the fact that this one toad species produces 5-MeO-DMT. And Ken had a light bulb go off. He found a Sonoran Desert toad, and he squeezed the gland onto his windshield. And when it dried, he scraped it off and he smoked it. And he had a transcendental experience. And he became so excited by this that he wrote a pamphlet he would just leave this this pamphlet in places wherever he went. It has its its risks. Uh, someone said uh, this can either cure PTSD or it can cause it. Uh, yeah, so I creep when up. people collect yeah. toads, and uh, they usually grab great buckets full or bags full, and they they take them to a central location where they uh, squeeze the glands and collect the substance, and they don't return the toad. They have habitats, they have neighborhoods, if you will. And if they're removed from them, then they have a very low survival rate. Okay, and so I'm gonna pause it there. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. So this toad is 
native to the Sonoran Desert, right? It lives in the, the shrubs. It um, lives mainly in the wash areas and um, dried up lake beds, right? Uh, and so, um, and it goes into a torpor or sort of a um, hibernative state underground. And then when it rains, it comes out and mates. Um, and so what you're seeing here is you're seeing people collecting this toad during a monsoon rain where the toad has come out. Um, one of the big problems with that is, is that you're taking massive amounts of toads out of their natural habitat um, and they're not putting them back. And so the toads can't survive not in their natural habitat. So that's one big thing. The second thing that you have to think of is because they're taking a lot of toads and sticking them in close contact, they're more likely to pass diseases on to each other, even if they do release them. So there's a fungal disease. Um, and I think he mentioned it in the video that um, toads transmit from one toad to another um, by contact. And so this fungal disease is deadly and it has um, been known to, to wipe out toad populations. And so that's a concern as well. Um, I wanted to get into a little bit of the um, the toxicology or um, the the aspect of the toad that is the hallucinogenic part. So um, let me um, get into this a little bit more with the time that we have left. So, and I apologize, my screen is like getting cut off. <laughs> So 5-MeO-DMT is the hallucinogenic compound that these toads produce. Um, it is produced from their uh, parotid gland. So this is actually a salivary gland. Um, normally we have, we have parotid glands over here. Um, we have salivary glands underneath our tongue and they kick up saliva with the digestive enzymes. Um, for these toads, they actually produce it from their parotid gland. Um, and under their, they have little glands under their legs uh, that produce it. Um, this is dimethyloxy um, and dimethyltryptamine, um, which is an analog of, of dimethyltryptamine. Um, it's a Schedule One controlled substance, so you, you can get arrested for doing this. Um, and it is similar to other toxins that are produced in toads and plants. Um, but it's a little, it's uh, got that hallucinogenic, that slightly different molecule on that. Um, it's often referred to as God molecule, uh, in case you've uh, heard of it before. Um, let's click to the next step. So bufo, bufotenin is um, the ear tint that most toads produce. So if you've held a toad, um, you know that they produce like a slime coat and there's this um, amino acid compound in it that's an irritant or this protein compound, the bufotenin. Um, this will normally um, cause dogs to spit it out, right? But these toads, the Sonoran Desert toads, have an enzyme that converts it to the um, MEO-DMT, the, um, the toxic one or, um, you know, the, the poisonous one. Um, this can actually, so it goes through the mucous membrane, so through your mouth, through your nose, um, and it can cause auditory and visual hallucinations for us. Um, it can actually cause death in dogs and animals. So if a coyote picks up these toads or if a dog picks up these toads and actually eats them or gets them in their mouth, it can cause death. Um, it can cause cardiac arrest, coma, and death um, in people as well. So uh, you want to be careful about not going around licking toads. And I think if you look this up, um, there was actually, there's some articles that said how the National Park Service had put um, an advisory up, hey, don't lick these toads, they're they're poisonous. Um, and it's actually, it's really cute. They have a little toad um, face looking up at them. Um, so here's your, here's a research paper that I looked up. Uh, and because I was looking for, um, how they're dealing with this in research because we've heard a lot of, of um, hallucinogenics uh, be used in research like LSD um, with great benefit. And so here's the the toad. Um, here's the scientific name Bufo alvarius. Um, and we know that that's now outdated. Um, but so when people uh, did MEO DMT, they found that um, they felt that they had health benefits from it. So the scientific community decided to um, take the tryptamine and make synthetic MEO-DMT and use that for clinical studies. 
Um, and so I'm not sure I don't go around, I don't regularly do this. So I don't know if they have synthetic MEO DMT that you can uh, buy, but I assume that um, some type of chemical company or drug company is, is making this because they're using it for uh, research. So the, the five MEO DMT um, belongs to the group of naturally occurring uh, psychoactive uh, indole alchemines uh, drugs this is probably something that you've talked about in your meetings um, it activates serotonin receptors so it gives you that really feel good response um, amplification of your emotional state it, it makes people feel like their ego has dissolved and they're actually able to really see um, a global picture of how they you know fit and feel um we have mostly we have most of our serotonin receptors are in the frontal lobe and that um is uh develops around age 24 25 so this is kind of our logical rational brain and so this increases rational brain thinking um it increases the feel good of the rational brain um and then people report distortions in auditory and time perception with these um so if you look on the left this is actually um the different types of drugs and the receptor types that they bind to and then the cellular response in the postsynaptic neuron um the meo dmt binds to this receptor 5-ht2a um you can also see dmt on the right hand side binds to the sigma receptor and what these do is this activates or upregulates a serotonin and serotonin um is our feel-good our feel good neurotransmitter in our brain. And so this decreases depression, decrease anxiety and mood disorders. Um, and so what they found clinically speaking um, in Retwig, and this is pretty much a recent study in 22, um, 2022 that found that vaporized dosing of up to 18 milligrams does um, reduce depression, anxiety and, dis and stress. And it's a rapid um, reduction and a sustained reduction in uh, mood disorders. Uh, and so, and this wasn't from the frogs, it was um, a synthetic analog. So the analog means that it mimics and it has the same characteristics as the natural founding or natural occurring compound. Um, so they're currently researching in that, but they also found that it simulates neuroendocrine function, um, immunoregulation and anti-inflammatory processes. And so I thought this was really cool, um, that it actually goes to your pituitary gland and it causes you to increase prolactin secretion. Prolactin is typically used when women are, when they have a baby and this causes them to lactate and produce milk. So it increases the prolactin production, the milk production um, increases the bonding, um, the oxytocin are released with the prolactin. Um, it also decreases inflammatory biomarkers. So when you typically have immune system issues or inflammation or like long COVID, or rheumatoid arthritis, um, you have inflammatory markers that we can actually measure in the blood. It decreased those levels. Um, and in the middle, it decreased inflammatory cytokines. And so it decreases um, your immune responses. So the systemic immune effects that cause you to feel pain intracellular inside the cell and outside of the cell um, were decreased as well. And so it sounds like they're in the academic realm now looking at that. They're not quite in the pharmaceutical mass pr producing it um, as an analog or a way to, to treat all of these things, but it is of interest and it is on the radar of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, and so here is the little YouTube video that I shared with you. And here is my email address. Um, you can reach me at jbacky at Valley College EDU. Um, email me questions, let me know what you thought, and thank you for having me. Have a great day. Bye. All right, thanks to Professor Joan uh, Murillo for her time in preparing this excellent preparation, uh, presentation. I think uh, I learned a lot, and I, I appreciate the different perspective from the, from the biologist. And um, I want to follow up with a few comments on the effects of 5-MeO-DMT. I don't know if I can really contribute much to what she uh, offered. And so I'm going to let the, the biologist talk about the biology. And I'd like to talk about some uh, things that are more uh, specific to the humanities in my areas. So uh, the following was taken from the pamphlet, 
Bufo Alvarius, The Psychedelic Toad of the Sonoran Desert by Albert Most, published in 1983. That was referenced in Joan's video. It says the following. The venom from Bufo Alvarius is extremely hallucinogenic when vaporized by heat and taken into the lungs in the form of smoke. An adequate dose for a normal adult of average size is a piece of dried venom about the size of a paper match head. Shave it into thin slices with a razor blade and put the pieces in a clean one-toke pipe fitted with a brass screen. Designate this pipe strictly for smoking toad venom as the accumulation of residue in the bowl and condensation of vapors within the stem can yield an unintentional high with other smoking materials. Apply a suitable flame and smoke the contents of the bowl in one complete inhalation. Try to, try to hold the smoke in your lungs as long as possible, as the effectiveness will depend largely on the full dose being absorbed in one breath. Within 30 seconds, there will be an onset of an almost overwhelming psychedelic effects. You will be completely absorbed in a complex chemical event characterized by an overload of thoughts and perception, brief collapse of the ego, and loss of the space-time continuum. Relax, breathe regularly, and flow with the experience. After two to three minutes, the initial intensity fades to a pleasant LSD-like sensation in which visual illusions, hallucinations, and perceptual distortions are common. You may sense a distortion in your perceived body image or notice the world shrinking or expanding. You may notice the, the colors seem that colors seem brighter and more beautiful than usual. And most likely, you will experience a euphoric mood interspersed with bursts of unmotivated laughter. This ineffable episode is of extremely short duration. The hallucinogenic effects dissipate rapidly, and the entire psychedelic cycle is completed within 15 minutes. There is no hangover or harmful effect. On the contrary, a pleasant psychedelic afterglow appears quite regularly and may last several hours to several days after smoking the venom of Bufo Alvarius, the psychedelic toad of the Sonoran Desert. He then goes on to give some advice. Every psychedelic experience is chiefly a function of set and setting, of preparation and environment. The better prepared you are, the better experience will be for you. Consider the following instructions. Smoke the venom fairly early on the day, uh, fairly early in the day on an empty but not starving stomach. Do not drink any alcohol or take any drugs or medication prior to smoking the venom. Provide a comfortable setting which is as free as possible from unforeseen distractions and intrusions. Make sure you will not be disturbed for at least 30 minutes. Be comfortably seated or prone prior to inhaling the vapors. All right, in Professor Morillo's presentation, she showed a video by Robert Villa in which he comments on the effects of smoking 5-MeO. He mentioned pixelated visions, feelings of love, clarity, and a general awakening of reality and consciousness. He also said that 5-MeO-DMT might be able to cure PTSD uh, or cause it, and that some people have been traumatized by the experience and need years of therapy. This is an essential quality of psychedelics in that they reveal the mind. That is, they have been called nonspecific amplifiers, and whatever it is you bring to the medicine gets increased. And a big part of this is the idea of set and setting. Because these sacred substances have been set apart because of their powerful, uh, because of their powerful effects, they aren't for careless or thoughtless use. Although certain plants do lend themselves to more casual use. But even when used recreationally, we should do so with a spirit of gratitude for the powers of the natural world. But because these substances are sacred, the individual that works with them needs to set him or herself apart from society before consumption. 
There are different ways to achieve this moral, spiritual, and social preparation to meet the plant on its own level. It might be as simple as having an idea in mind that you want to explore and understand more. This might be the bare minimum of what is often called setting an intention. And this refers to the mental preparation before consuming psychedelics. But in the sophisticated fields of divination, the degree of preparation and intention increase significantly. It wouldn't be unusual for patient and practitioner to practice sexual abstinence and fast from food and drink for numerous days. In particular, heavy foods, meats, drugs, and alcohol are avoided. So this type of ritualized behavior helps create the appropriate set. Historically, a well-developed mindset might have included seeking to know the outcome of a battle against an enemy, or maybe finding the source and cure of an ailment. Perhaps it's the location and condition of a lost relative, the direction or the, uh, the direction of the best game for hunting, the identity of a perpetrator, or the location of lost or stolen objects. Another effect that is common when working with Bufo is ego loss or ego death. And that also was mentioned in the video that we saw. There are two similar manifestations of this type of experience. First, it seems that you either merge with everything in the universe and thereby lose the integrity of yourself, or your understanding of self is shattered into a nothingness of pure darkness or light. In both cases, the individual ego or the self seems to be subservient to the all or to the nothing. This type of extreme experience can have serious consequences. When the finite mind of the conscious self meets the infinite nature that lies beyond death, there is sure to be a reckoning. And guess which one loses? We see something similar on psilocybin, where a common experience is to feel like you are melting into the furniture. On higher doses of shrooms, you might dissolve into the limitless nothingness too. Remember, these substances are all members of the same tryptamine family. That's to say LSD, psilocybin, DMT, and 5-MeO-DMT are chemically similar so that they have similar effects. Another way to put it is the following. Imagine that your destination uh, or the destination of your trip is the destruction of your ego and you could get there by flying. Well, if that, was the, if that was the case, LSD would be like taking a laser-powered starship. Shrooms would be like strapping yourself to the outside of a rocket and holding on for dear life. Consuming DMT might be like traveling through a wormhole. Well, smoking toad is like being blasted into a million pieces into a nothingness of light. It's not the ego death. It's not... Uh, the ego death of you merging with everything in the known universe, it's more like you turned into nothing in the middle of nothingness for the rest of never. This type of lesson can be quite overwhelming. It's the lesson of from known space to no space, which is a form of saying from finite to, infi to infinite, but it's also from mortal to eternal which I usually think of as no time instead of all of it. So this is a limit-destroying and boundary-dissolving medicine. It opens your soul to an understanding of different ways to see and experience the universe. A view into that type of vision might be significantly overwhelming to an individual who's not mentally, physiologically, psychologically, socially, or spiritually grounded. Sometimes the visions and revelations are so significant that they change the course of life from one day to the next. Okay, we need to talk about this other place that people report going to. It's the place that you can access with the help of these powerful spirits and these plants and animals. It's a place that has many appearances and many mansions. 
It's a place of infinite emotion and knowledge. It's inhabited. Did I disappear there? Hang on. Let me see if I can get myself back. All right. There we're back here. All right. So we're talking about this place that people go to. It's a place of infinite emotion and knowledge. It's inhabited by many different types of spirits, souls, gods, demons, and angels. It's a space that's not a place where time does not exist. We could call it the spiritual plane or the spiritual or the spirit world. At least that's the language I used growing up in a Christian household. You might feel comfortable with the term extra dimensional, and that's fine. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. What I mean by that is it doesn't matter what you call it. Heaven, hell, the afterlife, the spiritual plane, the spirit world, purgatory, the 13 levels of heaven, the nine levels of the underworld. The name doesn't matter as much as the underlying experience. And the overwhelming consensus is that the power of sacred plants, and in this one case, the power of the toad, can send your spirit or consciousness, or whatever you want to call it, to some other plane of existence. Many people say that it feels more real than their existence here on earth. And if that doesn't blow your mind, then I don't know what will. So where is this place? What is this place? And that might be an irrelevant question. You see, these substances disrupt the perception of the fabric, the fabric of space-time. Well, maybe that's not entirely true. They, they seem to send you to a spirit world, which is both infinite and eternal. In other words, you're technically outside of space and time. In other words, there is no place. What is the purpose of traveling to this place? Well, historically, when used by indigenous groups, the purpose is to acquire knowledge that is normally unavailable in our normal perception of existence. This knowledge is usually acquired from ancestors, deities, spirits, incarnate uh, spiritual powers, intelligence, something like that. But there definitely seems to be some kind of communication. Let's shift gears a little bit. Part of the psychedelic experience is the idea of resistance or maybe non-resistance. A common experience is to resist the ideas and things experienced. This often results in a very challenging experience. Some people call it a bad trip. But the solution to this type of challenge is for the individual to submit to the experience. And once that happens, once that submission has been has been performed, the perspective takes a decidedly positive characteristic. Let's say, for example, you took two grams of dried mushrooms. You get high, but you can still ground yourself. In other words, you still have a visual connection with the real, with the real world. But if you took, say, 15 grams of dried mushrooms, there's nothing you could do to stay tethered to this existence and you would eventually dissolve into all the colors of the universe. But that might happen over the course of several hours. With 5-MeO-DMT five smoked from toad venom, uh, the effects are so overwhelmingly and extremely strong and fast acting, there's almost no way to resist. The only option you have is to give in to the power of the toad and the experience that you're having. In other words, it, it almost makes it easier to accept because it's too hard to resist. With one puff, you're on your way, moving fast, headed toward an alternate reality. We talked about how Bufal Various presents a very interesting case study for us. We weren't around to see the discovery of peyote. The Mexica or Aztecs claimed that the Chichimex were the ones that discovered it. But that's as close as we can get to this moment of self-essay and discover and discovering the power of a certain substance. 
We don't know how exactly humans discovered psilocybin mushrooms or morning glory seeds or any, any number of the other sacred plants that we're going to be studying. But with Bufal various, we have a very clear, very recent, documented discovery of the power of this substance. I also mentioned that it presents an interesting lesson for us because we can see the creation and evolution of a spiritual or religious connection to the uh, substances secreted by Bufo Alberius. This comes in the form of the Church of the Tree of Life, founded in California in 1971 by John Mann, but now defunct, declared, declaring the use of 5-MeO-DMT uh, as a sacrament. And this substance was, uh, was smoked uh, various uh, over a period of uh, more than a decade, and it was discreetly available to its members. And, uh, it's now defunct, but uh, we can see how a spiritual belief uh, has, has had started to be uh, connected or tethered to this, um, this substance. Um, that's going to be it for uh, today's lecture, uh, today's lesson. And we'll be following up uh, next time uh, with other substances. I think our next one is uh, Morning Glories. Uh, so we'll be talking about um, the Ipamoea family. And uh, uh, we'll talk to you then. Thanks so much for being here.